Government representatives from around the world gathered in Dubai earlier this month to discuss internet regulation. Representatives from almost 190 countries met at the World Conference on International Communications to update rules for the web. Countries like China, Iran and Russia have wanted an international treaty that would give them a much tighter control over what happens online. Well, our guest tonight is Brett Solomon. He's the executive director of accessnow.org, a website the, uh, that supports digital freedoms and human rights. Welcome to the drum, Brett. Thank you for having me. Now, tell us a bit about the ITU, because a lot of people may not know about it. It was uh, the, and this big, big yeah. meeting that was on in Dubai. So it's kind of an obscure body. Um, traditionally, it's looked at issues around telephony, um, and it's the last time that it's actually updated its underlying treaty was 1988. So it decided it was going to update its treaty, and many countries like Russia and China thought it was an opportunity to give governments control of the internet by increasing the mandate from phones to internet now that we're in 2012. And what did they want to do? Well, they wanted to do a range of different things. They wanted to be able to know how traffic was routed through the network. Um, they wanted to be able to control spam. They had a significant focus on cyber security. All of these issues are obviously internet-related issues, and that would give government control over information that we think of as private and secure. Um, that poses significant concerns for human rights, it poses significant concerns for economic development and all of the other issues that we're, we rely upon the internet for. Okay, so the US was concerned, Australia was concerned, neither country well, signed ended the up, treaty? That's right, they ended up not signing the treaty. What were the sticking points? Um, well, one of the issues was around spam. Uh, we think of it as content that we don't want to receive, so it's sort of mass information. but. But if governments can control unwanted content, that gives them the capacity to be able to control information that they might see as unwanted from a political purpose. Um, it also, the ITU is a government controlled body and internet governance traditionally has been a multi-stakeholder environment. So you have government, civil society, companies. If you move governance of the internet to a government controlled body, you have government decisions and that's not necessarily to the advantage of citizens. Okay, so this treaty didn't get signed. What happens next? Well, I think what this meeting did, the ITU meeting, is that it pushed internet governance up to the top of the international agenda the same way that we see the financial crisis, for instance, or climate change. So we now have internet governance right at the front and centre of international diplomacy. Um, and there will be a whole series of meetings. This is the beginning of the story, not the end of the story. We're going to see meetings all throughout 2013. It's really the battle for the open internet, and hopefully civil society wins. OK, so China and Russia and Iran and countries like that are obviously pushing in one way, way and Western nations pushing in another. Can Ch China and Iran and, uh, and Russia end up just going and doing their own thing anyway, regardless of well, whether the US agrees with them? Yeah. I mean, if you look what's happened in the Iranian context, they're in the process of establishing what they call a halal internet, an intranet in a sense, that wow. in enables... A bit flawed. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and, and it enables um, the government to control email, to control content, to control the Twitter sphere, etc. And what, what will they call the intranet? Electricery? <laughs> well, it, that's right. I mean, it does actually put... Like, if you look in the phone book, you expect to see all the people who are, who are listed in the country. At the moment, governments are able to take out content, take out phone numbers, take out individuals, block sites, etc. The ITU was an opportunity to um, force certain governments to mandate that, to make it internationally acceptable. The norms that we're seeing at the moment is an increase in censorship, is an increase in surveillance, even in, within the Australian context. And so what we want is progressive governments to stand up and say, the internet is so essential for the enjoyment of rights, so essential for economic development, etc., that we need to leave it under-regulated in the same way it has over the last so, 10 so, years. So what are your thoughts on how Nicola Roxon's been with, um, with, the, with, you know, with these issues? With data retention, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is part of those international trends that I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, the white paper that she released, um, which is around the Telecommunications Intercept Act, would, have give, would give the government greater access to data. But also, what we're seeing is a real privatisation of this space. So you have massive companies like Google and Facebook, etc., required to hold on to retain data for two years. These are things that are very concerning. They give the green light to authoritarian states. And, and I think that the Australian community has repeatedly said to the government, we don't want you monitoring our 
communications. We're not suspects, we're citizens, and we want our information to be private in the same way as we do have in, in private communications. So, Brett, obviously Australia didn't want to sign up to this treaty, but what's Australia's record like on digital freedom? It's been relatively quiet, to be honest. I think that there's been a problem because there's been this mandatory filtering regime domestically. So for them to be able to then go internationally and mm. say internet freedom is an important international and diplomatic concern of theirs, like the US government... But they've now dropped that filter. They've dropped screen. that. So there's a perfect opportunity now for, in this moment where, from our perspective, this is the front line of human rights. If the government is concerned about international human rights is concerned about good governance. It needs to protect the openness of the internet and it also needs to be an advocate of that on the international stage, which it hasn't been to date. Bernard, this is an area you write about. I'm sure you want to chip in here. Yeah, I mean, Steve, I think you've put your finger on it. I mean, it, it, it was good to see Stephen Conroy and other, you know, basically other Anglophone uh, countries leading the opposition to the, you know, this reflexive instinct of a lot of countries in the ITU to try and extend the, the, you know, the, the telephony regulation regime over to the internet. But you know, the great irony was that while Stephen Conroy was over in Dubai leading the charge there, uh, you know, Nicola Roxon here has been, been doing pretty much exactly the same thing on a domestic level. I mean, you know, the national security inquiry that, uh, that's been going ahead is going to be going ahead a little bit longer now because it's not going to report by the end of the year like it was, like it was supposed to, is exactly the same logic that a lot of countries were trotting out at the ITU, that, you know, uh, the, the, the telecommunications and communications technology has moved on. You know, we need to extend the regulatory framework to, to embrace the internet. And, um, you know, there's a deep irony in the United States and Australia, particularly the United States, which is, you know, rapidly becoming one of the world's most profound su surveillance states, leading the charge in Dubai against, uh, against internet regulation whilst um, trying to extend the level of censorship uh, and, um, and surveillance online, you know, to, a, to an ever greater degree. And, um, and it, would be re it would be wonderful if the rhetoric of freedom and, uh, and, uh, and deregulation that we heard from the Anglophone countries in Dubai about the, the ITU was extended domestically so that, um, so that we had the same sort of uh, approach of, of um, you know, being hostile to surveillance and, uh, and regulation here. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's right. I mean, there's a real schizophrenia that we see with many of the Western nations. It's important to note that it wasn't just actually the Anglophone countries within the ITU, that they were actually, there were many African states that also balked um, at the treaty. Um, so what well, we... Well, Nigeria did. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, you know, this is really an inflexive point right now where we need to ensure that domestic policy and international policy are consistent and that they stand on the side of rights and also this whole new concept of digital due process. We have due process offline. We need to ensure that there's digital due process uh, online, which means that we have judicial protection, that if you want information about a user, you need to get a warrant, for instance. Um, and and, and those, that sort of environment is established. Otherwise, we do risk losing many of the protections that we've developed over the last you know, 50, 60 years. Brett, Brett just briefly, um, the whole issue of the innocence of Muslims and, and that being on YouTube and what that led to, that must lead to some kind of pressure for some form of censorship. Obviously a very complex issue and much of this actually comes down to terms of service. In fact, what we're seeing is the privatisation of censorship and that's a very difficult and complex um, um, environment for companies to operate in. How do they actually decide what is lawful content, what is inflammatory content, etc.? Um, those, those processes aren't properly established. I think the thing is that we need to, as I say, err on the side of rights, not on the, err on the side of exceptions to okay, rights. OK, Brett, thanks very much for coming Thank on you. the show. And thanks to all our panellists today, Rhys Muldoon, Adam Crichton and Bernard. And the drum website is abc.net.au forward slash the drum. Now we're taking a break over Christmas. Our next show is on January the 7th. Join us again then. Thanks for your company this year. Have a great Christmas and see you in 2013.